In May 2000, Sharon became the second woman to be elected president of the Australian Council of Trade Unions. Four years later, she became the first woman to be elected president of the World Union Body, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, which represents 148 million workers in 150 countries. Sharon is also the first woman to be elected president of the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions Australia Pacific Region Organization. You know, just standing here makes my heart sing for two reasons. One, that you are having a debate about rights. All the other R's, as important as they are, about rights. During the period of the Howard government, there were probably a handful of people who talked about rights. You can name them. A couple of them are on the panel, Sev, Robert and others. And uh, It was like there was this veil of oppression about what everyone else talked about internationally in Australia. And so it is just terrific that you are talking about it. And I might say, in terms of the Bill of Rights, one of those groups, of course, was the new Matilda. And uh, if you haven't read the Bill of Rights, I'm sure you all have, then it's a fine piece of uh, draft legislation in plain English and covers uh, the international uh, um, standards, conventions, etc. And in the 60th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, of which freedom of association is one, we have a particular interest in making sure that the debate is alive. And of course, the government is sponsoring consultations around that. The other reason that uh, my heart sings is that a woman whose family adopted Australia actually can stand here and, and as an activist voice, help shape the, uh, the very heart and soul of Australia, which of course should have the respect for multiculturalism and diversity that she's talked about. I mean, that's a wonderful thing as well. I'm going to talk to you um, briefly about what the challenge is for social inclusion and, and what damage we have to rebuild. Yesterday um, I, was, uh, I, I gave an address at the press club and I said that it was incredible that Peter Costello could stand there just two weeks ago and actually say that his era, his era would be rem remembered as an age of prosperity. Now, I was so shocked by that that I went looking for other comments. And I think if you look at uh, Associate Professor of Economics Steve Keane, he called it actually in the age just uh, a couple of weeks ago where he said from 1994, as Australia congratulated itself on the long boom, the debt ratio more than doubled to its current 165 per cent. And when you know that households are carrying an enormous debt, an enormous debt, that the pressure on working families is extraordinary, then that alone would make you pretty mad about that. But let me tell you some other things. Our productivity levels, economy-wide, went from 45 per cent above the OECD average in, in the 1990s to almost 40 per cent below it in 2000 and to 2008. The first six months of work choices, those dreadful IR laws, saw productivity decline by 1.6 per cent, and it's barely recovered since. Our investment in education is a global scandal. Tertiary education was cut by 7 per cent since 1995, while the average OECD increase was 48 per cent. 300,000 people, despite a skills deficit, 300,000 people were turned away from TAFE and 150,000 from universities. Our public schools are in trouble and uh, we are reliant on uh, temporary migrant labour for skills which has brought its own exploitative practices tolerated by the Howard Costello um, leadership. Our infra infrastructure complaints, uh, constraints are now infamous and yet we still see the opposition wanting to play uh, politics with the infrastructure fund in the Senate. So it is somewhat gratifying, I must say, that these things are now starting to be acknowledged. And when you see commentators um, indicating that the Howard Costello years were not so rosy for low and middle income families, then you do have some hope that at least the truth will out. Because when you look at the Hilda data from, Mel from the Melbourne, analysed by the Melbourne Institute, then it shows that four in ten Australians said their incomes fell 
between 2001 and 2005, and that was before work choices hit the, uh, hit the scene. Of those who managed a rise in income, the median gain was significantly less than the overall growth in the economy, and almost 30 per cent of working uh, couples uh, uh, with no children say their incomes fell. So it wasn't just constrained to, uh, to ch uh, families with children. Now, Professor Mark Wooten is a reasonably conservative voice in Australia. He says he found the study's, uh, the study's result quite surprising at face value. But we can tell you they come as no surprise. Our qualitative research over the past five years, the same research we used to underpin the campaign against work choices, has consistently found large numbers of working families struggling to keep their heads above water financially. Not at all surprising given that, the same, that since 1998 the cost of living for working households increased by 40 per cent, more than uh, the CPI 36 per cent. And what you've got is a wages profit share that looks like a set of alligator jaws. For, uh, for wage, uh, profits are at about 28 per cent, which is uh, pretty much the highest in 50 years, and wages are down to about 52 per cent, which, uh, in, which are about the uh, lowest uh, on, on record, but certainly for, again, around the 50-year mark. If you think what that means, then what it means is you've got a two-speed economy and people in the second tier are really struggling, are really struggling. And it plays out right around the globe. It's worst, of course, in the US, and we remind people that the current financial crisis started with the subprime uh, uh, scandal, and it was largely because American workers couldn't earn enough to pay their mortgages. And when you get defaults on loans, then you get the financial system unravelling. Now there are some structural, um, other structural inequities that are deep, and I'm not going to go into them today. But for su suffice to say, even again, conservative commentators like Larry Summers from the Financial Times in the U.S. have been saying, with the union movement, with the OECD leadership, with the ILO, and many others now, for about five to seven years. That, that, that gap between wages and profit share was escalating to dangerous levels. In the US, five years ago, it was at a 30-year high in terms of profits relative to wages, and, and you know the story of the rest of it. So there is an already existing and deep-seated financial insecurity amongst working Australians, and uh, that certainly underpinned much of the public backlash that the coalition experienced against work choices. Um, contrary to that, I don't want to talk to you about IR particularly today, except we must get it right. We absolutely must get it right. The safety net that the government's put on the table, if it's passed, will actually reinsert a floor of dignity under every worker. There are some gaps still in the collective bargaining rights, and we hope that when we see the final detail of the legislation that we will be relieved about that. But if we don't get collective bargaining right, then we'll end up in the same mess because, again, it's those alligator jaws and the only way to close them is to be able for workers to bargain collectively. The, the, the system for the low-paid workers, for the first time ever, a, uh, a system I think that's my phone, I'm sorry, just ignore it. I didn't turn it off, Seb, obviously. Um, the, the, but the system for low-paid workers to get off the safety net and bargain in a multi-employer sense will change the face of community workers, of contract cleaners, of childcare workers, if we can get it right, with a, a strong um, uh, role for the independent umpire. But I do want to emphasise that the legacy of the Howard Costello years for working Australians and their family is one of profound financial fragility. And in the context, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the government is right, our banks aren't in the same situation, but we ought not to ignore the warning signs, and we had something to say about that yesterday. But I want to absolutely acknowledge that uh, you know, this will be assisted by a fairer industrial relations system. Now, let me tell you a little bit about um, uh, inequality in the female face, because the growing inequality in Australia has a very female face. It isn't just that we can tell you that 16.3 per cent is the gap between women and men's wages on, uh, on average weekly earnings. That's one thing that's quite scandalous and needs to be addressed, and the government has, of course, a review into pay equity on the table. That's a terrific thing. 
But I can tell you that uh, between 2001 and 2006, the real wages of full-time women in the private sector fell by almost 2 per cent. That's a pretty appalling statistic. But let me tell you the one that, that uh, or I can tell you that female workers who were on individual contracts earned an average of $2.90 an hour or $100 less a week than women on collective agreements, and that's why we need an IR system that's robust. But let me tell you the one that really worries me. The, whale, the, the wages for male-dominated industries like mining and construction have always grown faster than those for dominant industries where women work, like retail and hospitality. But they used to track at about a 2 per cent deviation from the average. And you could see them tracking along until 2006. That, uh, that deviation from the median, sorry, not the average, the median, is, is uh, absolutely now almost 10 per cent. And so what's happening is that as inequality is growing, it's growing uh, um, indeed uh, uh, with a female face. So we need to correct those things. And, and again, that uh, the government's uh, inquiry is something we absolutely have to um, have, to have uh, a big input into. In terms of decent work, can I say to you that while there are all sorts of issues we support, um, the activities around like homelessness and uh, the support for disability and so forth, and I'll say a little bit about that in one minute. At the same time, the, uh, the fastest way out of poverty we know, the fastest way to a secure future is decent work. It's actually work that has rights, and that includes uh, the right to bargain for decent wages. And when I tell you that the things that worry us in terms of barriers to work include in income security for those seeking work. We have to congratulate again the government, particularly uh, Brendan O'Connor and Bill Shorten, for, the, for, for actually guaranteeing people with a disability who are on a disability pension that if they seek work, if they seek work, they won't be disadvantaged if it doesn't work out by losing their pension security. We've been advocating this. I think, Laurie, we were having these discussions in the early 90s because people who were on social security were telling us that the biggest fear for them in tackling work was, in fact, to know that they weren't going to lose out. And those dreadful years of punishing people, you know, in terms of punitive act and breaching, they called it, where people lost income from six to 13 weeks. Why? Because they had a go at work. And for all sorts of reasons, the first time it didn't work, the second time it mightn't have worked. But you can't shift a cultural experience for people that ultimately results in security if we don't give them a number of attempts, depending on their circumstances, to actually find work and support them. So that's a good step forward, and let's hope that we see some of that extended, because the evidence, I hope, will show that it works. We are worried about the um, effective marginal tax rates and the loss of income from social security and family tax benefits that happen so that often people who, uh, again, go into work off Social Security can lose up to about 70 per cent, or they're paying tax at about 70 per cent, way more than anybody else. And indeed, I would say to, uh, um, uh, again to the government, the tax review is critical that it gets it right for working Australians, and it's a good thing that we're having another look at all of that. Access to skills training and discrimination are two other areas. Can I say on discrimination? This is music to Sev's heart, of course, there is actually a review, at least at the moment, of the Sex Discrimination Act, and we want to see a much more activist uh, piece. If, uh, if some ideas that we have are picked up, then we could see um, a capacity to actually take discrimination cases by uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner to have representative rights to go beyond the individual jurisdiction and actually make the uh, class action environment much more ro robust. I'd like to see some joint appointments with Fair Work Australia, maybe even a discrimination division in Fair Work Australia, where you can take that jurisprudence with uh, those people working jointly, drive it through the safety net, through the award system, and start to shift the culture of discrimination in our workplaces, not just for women, but indeed across the board over time. And of course, uh, in uh, um, what I would say to you, I suppose, about the issues around barriers that result from work go to, of course, one of my pet subjects, and that's the collision of work and care, and in particular, not, not only, of course, for working women with children and their partners, but also increasingly for elder care. But we do know 
that in terms of paid maternity leave, it's a foundation stone to give people security, financial security, to have time out to recover and enjoy the birth of their children. The 18 weeks proposal from the Productivity Commission plus two weeks of paternity leave at minimum rates with superannuation, and if I tell you that for every $10 in a male superannuation account, there's three in a woman's, then you know that's a little step towards equality. If, if, we can, uh, if the government picks that up, and you know, we'll have lots of consultation around it, but if the model is that or, uh, um, or, or with some improvements, then we will see an historic injustice undone. 30 years of campaigning for paid maternity leave, I can tell you I want to see this as finished business. Of course, improvements through bargaining and so forth will never be entirely finished. I'm a little disappointed it doesn't deal with stay-at-home mums. I think it's time we ended the divide. Women are absolutely, universally, almost entirely to the number in the workforce when they have their first child, and they will be again in equal numbers, uh, the stats tell us, when their children go to high school. So we'll continue to talk about that. In terms of um, childcare, we need to actually come back to look at those questions. Elder care has to be on the agenda as older workers are more and more in the workforce, but they're caring for older parents or indeed partners or siblings or other family members. Workplace rights I've talked about, including uh, unfair dismissal protections, almost back in the parliament, and uh, let's hope that uh, we can all celebrate that in the not too distant future. And of course, we have to do something about the long hours culture and excessive overtime, and that goes to, again, tapping, the un tapping those pools of labour that are not in work, and uh, the dominant one is indeed women, and a pretty much a lost generation if we're not careful of young people—500,000 young people not in uh, work and not in full-time study, and we have to find a way to bring those back into the fold. So the social and economic inequality that this all portrays should be ringing alarm bells. It is absolutely ringing a framework of discussion with the government, and you can see the myriad of reviews and stuff they've put on the table. We need to be active within those, and remember that you, you know we need to build the the, um, the stepping stones, if you like. I, mean, I said yesterday, but one thing the union movement's good about: we never give up. We never give up. We take the next step, and then we move on. And uh, that's uh, got to become a basis of the way we generate greater equality and ex inclusion. It's no accident that countries like. Uh, uh, the countries with the lowest measure of income equality, such as Denmark, Sweden, Germany and Finland, are amongst the most stable, prosperous and cohesive societies in the world. Why? It's a direct result of decades of sustained investment in education, in training, in high-valued uh, added production, fostered by social uh, partnerships, strong workplace rights, social security uh, for the most vulnerable, and a commitment to wealth distribution that is absolutely missing in this country, and indeed, if you want to see where it's dynamite, it's of course in the US. So we support a Bill of Rights. We absolutely support radical and innovative changes to the Sex Discrimination Act and its marriage in some way uh, with uh, uh, a, di a discrimination division of Fair Work Australia. The government's talking about a, a compact with the community. We can do a lot in terms of setting an agenda for discussion over decades if we get that right. And so uh, I would say 300 days. The best thing is that there are processes you can engage in. There's some runs on the board already, or potential runs on the board, like uh, the d disability issue, the affordable housing issue we've campaigned for for years. And you know, PML this week, again, a great piece of optimism, the IR laws. There's lots going on. The review of, of even the review of the acts in terms of eradicating discrimination in terms of same-sex partners. Those things that have excluded people for decades, it's now possible not just to talk about—we should have been talking about it for uh, the last 11 years—but not just to talk about, but to actually engage, set the policy settings, and let's take back a decent Australia that you all care about, and we certainly do.